we had pretty equal email response, uh, I think, on George Soros earlier. We were just saying it was interesting that he was making all these comments. Um, he is, of course, a participant in this market like everybody else and continues to hold positions. I thought you were a bit rough on him, your earlier comments. Oh, come on. What do you mean rough on him? Why? Well, I thought you were saying you know, post, uh, kettle calling the pot black. I mean, no, no, I think yes, we were just saying, you know, be nice. Anything. I mean, of course, of course. You know, who, I'm, I'm just a lowly you know, minion that sits around the desk, and he's George well, Soros, of turn around now and say, oh, these imbalances are wrong for the world economy, etc., etc. Well, um, he makes a lot of money out of imbalances. Uh, he does rather well out of it, and so I'm sure to his philanthropic causes. But it, it's all very well to say, this is wrong, I think this is terrible, etc., etc. And already, potentially, as I say, we don't know, but maybe have a position on as well, and having done very well out of it over the last 30, 40 years of your career. OK. The, I think he's right, however. Um, fundamental to the debate today is ever since the problems emerged last July or as they became more and more to the forefront of everyone's attention uh, the Chinese have stepped in and they've re-pegged their currency to the dollar um, that is very cheap over the last 15 years the renminbi has fallen from 60 cents to the US dollar to a low of about five and trades are around seven or so, and they pegged it at seven. So seven versus the highs of 60 is a remarkably undervalued um, currency. Now, with the dollar weakness and with the renminbi being tied to it, it is creating phenomenal strains and stresses on the European economy and on the Japanese economy. Um, and it's creating profound deflationary forces. The euro and the yen are becoming just incredibly expensive. The Japanese are close now to losing trade surpluses. At these levels, they can't compete. And it shows no signs of abating, because the Chinese are unwilling to free their currency from the dollar. They don't want their currency to rise, because they fear that that will have a negative implication on the level of exports and on their ability to employ the great swathe of people they have in that country. So. It is, we have to discuss that because it is the issue of our time. Um, in terms of rebalancing, and Jeff, I'd be very interested to see, see what Stephen Roach has been saying in the book you've been reading, actually, as well, because it appears that a lot of the rhetoric is about um, a rebalancing as well as the, the global picture of China away from this huge export-led picture to more of the domestic story. I mean, you've been reading what Stephen Roach has to say, haven't you? Yeah, no, I, th I think he, he's of a mind. You know, we all recognise that the imbalances remain a challenge, and I think... Uh, he's also in your camp in a sense Hugh where he says well this primarily is a problem for China and this is a problem for the creditor nations yeah. it is not so much a problem for the debtor nations and particularly not for the United States because so much of its domestic economy is domestically focused and that's the rub here that the Chinese can sit there and they can demand that the Americans uh, should guarantee the value of their dollars but nobody asked the Chinese to run up the surpluses in dollars that they have at this stage mm -hmm. and, uh, and as we know they continue to participate in that game because they are unwilling to abandon their own currency to the volatility or the, the, the waves of, of, of currency markets which we know could be very choppy at, the t at times. And what it exposes is you require flexibility in policy to deal with these great dramatic events. Um, I would rather be if you will, in the UK, where my, my interest rates now are almost nothing, and where my currency has actually fallen 20, 25% against my trading partners. You know, London is busy, and exports represent 32% of the British economy. Yeah. So that has an immediate impact. The UK probably will run a current account surplus next year, money coming into the country. And yet there's a hysteria and there's a fear concerning the UK's policies. We've got to take a break. We'll be back. We'll pick it up in just a second. There's a fascination uh, concerning the very large telecom companies mm. today. Um, their valuation would seem to be um, a valuation you would associate with some kind of low. You know, they've, they've lost 89. You know, they peaked 10 years ago with the TMT bubble. Uh, today, businesses such as France Telecom or, or Deutsche Telekom yield 8%. And in America, AT&T would yield 6%. But the, the great flaw and the great bore is that the telecom operators are putting in, they're spending all of this money so that you can have these smartphones like I, uh, the iPhone, whatever, and you can watch these devices. Um, and it, it is very, very intensive use of their network, mm. but they get no rev they actually get very little revenue shedding Correct. in it. And you, you wonder, why spend the money? 
you know, why spend the money? It's, you know, they should almost be charging, you know, Apple or whatever to actually have the device to put into their network. It's kind of the wrong way around. So there's a, I'm not sure where we are with telecoms because presently they are very cash generative, the big dividends there. Um, but these capex commitments with very little return on it, mm. so that we can furnish this this vision in your services. Mm. I, I'd like to see them make more money from your service. Of course. So so would we, quite so, frankly. Yeah. You know, uh, it's the, the traditional ways of uh, operators providing services to consumers based on subscriptions is a dying model. Uh, you know, the consumers in today's market, and this is where third space can be quite important. We provide the content to every handset, not just smartphones and iPhones of this world, but somebody that is uh, slightly less better off uh, in a country which is slightly poorer than the, the emerging, in the emerging markets, can get our same services the same way as somebody in the Western markets with an iPhone. So there is this paradigm shift, and I think it's important that we put back into society and support the poorer mm. person with the low-grade handset just the same way we provide an iPhone app to somebody in the Western market for wanting to get the show live on their iPhone. Well, one of the interesting, um, t it's a broader question, Warwick, and mm. it, it's, it's the one about how you monetize um, content yeah. through platforms. Yeah. And it, it seems to me that still a lot of the great content companies yeah. just do not believe that the digital yeah. strategy is going to bring them the kind of return that they had anticipated yeah. for the great content that they're making here. Yeah. And as a result, they are reluctant to issue licenses mm. to a lot of new mm. innovative ways of distribution. And, mm. and I, I put what you're doing here in as one of those. Yes. How, do, how do we get around that? How do we make the content providers feel that they're getting the right price for what they're making? Well, I think the content providers have, have suffered in the past from this, from this decline in the subscription model. Uh, third space, we have a, a, a revolutionary way of dealing with this, this problem where we provide open access to the back of our system for the content owner and the operator and the advertiser so that they can simply go to thirdspace.com, they can log in and they can see their campaigns, they can see all their content, where it's gone, who's downloaded it, by what handset type, etc., cetera, etc., cetera. and that gives them the open transparency, and that gives them the comfort of dealing with companies like ourselves. Yeah. Whereas before, the operators have usually been very uh, standoffish about giving them access to their walled gardens, yeah. and you know the reporting procedures that go in the back have not always been completely transparent. So the the content owners and the advertisers haven't been given that feel-good factor to want to advertise more. Uh, we're going to wrap up with you, but thanks very much for coming in this morning. Thank you very Telling much. Telling us a bit more about the business. Warwick Hill, Chairman and CEO of Third Space Services. Um, Hugh, just to come back to you, um, uh, do you have any interest these days in media and, and media-related businesses? No? No, you, your eyes glaze over. That, that experience of trying to work around the music well, the, where I you mean, saw an undervalued you know, asset, I had, I had a, pay off for you. Yeah, I mean, you know, I, the, the, the example you cite is I invested in EMI, believing there was, there was value there that we had effectively said, you will never earn money from recording music again. And the implication would be, therefore, we will never have recorded music in the future. So I wanted to bet against that. Um, and, you know, I anticipated a bid for the business. Um, my downfall in that trade was the management. I still maintain we're the most incompetent management group in all time. And they managed to reject that deal at £3.20, only to accept a revised deal of £2.60 three months later. But anyway. Um, Hugh Hendry's views, of course, and, and not those of the channel. And we just make that point so that you know. Uh, Steve. Uh, make all their own art themselves. But well, Hugh, you and I were talking off air about this as well. And uh, quite apart from being a new phenomenon, actually artists have been doing that for centuries. As you say, they've been very often the salesmen who have put their scrawl in the bottom right hand corner of their pictures. It's not a new phenomenon for top artists to not produce their own art. Um. I don't think I truly want to be drawn into a debate on the art market, and um, but yes, I, I did say that. I did say that, and I think the other conversation we were having is we were discussing Vermeer because we are those kind of guys and we have those kind of conversations. <laughs> and I, I did find I'm sure, sure you'd be familiar. There was a time when there was the spate of forgeries and fakes, fake Vermeer, and when you look at them now, you think it's it's, it's just 
ridiculous. They're so obviously not Vermeer. You know, Vermeer, the girl with the pearl earrings, etc., like that. And what it but what it revealed was that you know a forgery doesn't work on being very legitimate. It actually works by being contemporary, by being by genuflecting to contemporary taste. Yeah, and I, I find that quite interesting. But anyway, I'm just talking. Going back to the issue. We're back. Uh, final thoughts from Hugh Hendry. We've got 30 seconds or so. Hugh, um, in part, what you would do at this point in the market then? Yeah, all I'm saying is I'm not a shepherd. I ain't looking for a flock. Yeah? I have views of the world which are, I think, distinct just now. I'm distinctly cautious. I'm not asking you to agree with me, but I'm just saying um, beware. Be aware if your view is shared and disseminated too widely because it could come back. And, and haunt you. Um, and there comes a time when it's not a question of greed, it comes more of just preserving your capital. I'm quite happy where I am, and events I think could take a turn uh, which I would be willing to you know, participate in. Well, good to have you on the programme once again, and come back and see us again soon. Hugh Hendry from Eclectica. That was Squawk Box, everybody. You have